As we stand, let's continue in prayer. Jesus said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Our Father, we praise you for the life you give to us in Christ. And so now as we come to hear your word, would your spirit be at work through it, giving us this life for Jesus' sake. Amen. Do be seated. The reading today can be found in the Church Bibles on page 33. I'll start reading from Genesis chapter 33 at verse 18. So that's page 33, Genesis 33, starting at verse 18. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Paddan Aram. And he camped before the city, and from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry, because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me for a, a, as great a bride price and gift as you will and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to him, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we'll be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem, and the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us, to become one people, when every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure, and killed all the males. 
they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Occasionally in family Bible times, we let the children decide what they want to hear, what they want to be read. We have a normal practice of working through books of the Bible just in a sort of childlike and appropriate way around the breakfast table. But every now and then, what would you like to hear? When they were younger, Daniel in the Lions. That was a popular one. Jonah in the Big Fish came up a number of times. Daddy, can I have extra pocket money for remembering it was a fish and not a whale? No, good try. <laughs> Queen Esther, favorite of the girls. Um, I think the all-time family Bible time favorite has been the four friends, you know, the ones that had the, the paralyzed man they lowered through the roof. Um, that has always gone down very well for us in family Bible times. Funnily enough, when we've given the children a choice of what they'd like to hear, they've never asked for the rape of Dinah. A bit of nervous laughter. They've never asked for the annihilation of Shechem. As far as I know, um, no children's Bible story includes the two incidents we've just heard about. I think if it had been my job to put together the preaching rota today, I would have made sure I wasn't doing it. Chapter 34 of Genesis, it's pretty gritty, unpalatable stuff, isn't it? One main point that we're aiming at today, it's all about sin. The thing that we learn is sin. And actually, when we think about it, these events, real events, actual people, it's, it's pretty stomach-churning stuff. But that's the point. That is the point of this section. The writer wants us to look sin right in the face and ponder the grit. We're going to do three things with our time today. We're, we're going to do what the writer wants us to do. Um, in the introduction, we'll look at the rape of Dinah in a little bit more detail. And then secondly, we'll look at the three main reactions Shechem, and Jacob, and the son's reactions to this abhorrent sin. And then finally, conclusions. We'll ask why. Why does the writer want us to ponder this sin? Why does the writer want us at this stage in the flow of Genesis to look sin directly in the eyes and draw conclusions? And what are they? That's where we're going today. You see, the book of Genesis was written by Moses to the people of Israel as they sort of wandered. Okay, they'd been taken out of slavery but they hadn't yet made it to the promised land. The first five books of the Bible were written into that context. God's people then needed to take time to ponder sin, to reflect on the horror, to look at sin directly in the eyes. We need to too. So meet Dinah, chapter 34 of Genesis. Now Dinah was the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob. She went out to see the women of the land. Now, just to, um, as you put together the, the writing um, around about this, the chapters either side, you can work out that Dinah was about 15 at this stage in the story. Her brothers are probably between the ages of about 16 and 22. So many of our main characters today are just children. I mean, this is more like the cast from The Hunger Games that we're dealing with today. You get the idea that Dinah wakes up one day and she's fed up with being cooped up in the tent. She's had enough. So she puts on her Jack Wills, gets her iPhone, headphones, of course, in, and she wanders off to see the city and the women of the land. And it sounds a little ominous, at least it should sound a little ominous if we've read the couple of verses before, which we heard just now as Jason read them to us so well. Just glance back to 3318. 
Um, just a couple of verses back from the beginning of our chapter. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Paddan Aram, and he camped before the city. See what it says? Jacob came safely to Shechem. The thing is, Jacob's not meant to be going to Shechem. He made a deal with God. You probably remember we had it a few sermons back. Back in chapter 28, he was going to return to his father's house at Bethel. Very, very clear. Now, Bethel's at least 20 miles, probably more, from Shechem. And as readers were meant to think, Jacob, what are you doing here? Shechem wasn't part of the plan. Okay, you may need to stop for a little bit and, and rest. But verse 19, you're buying land, you're pitching a tent. What's going on? The city, it's populated by Canaanites and Hivites. Whoever they are, they don't sound very friendly. This can't be good. I think at the very least, this is, this is rather reminiscent of Lot, actually, isn't it? Um, camping outside the city of Sodom. We all know what happened to him and his family. Jacob, this isn't good. You, you shouldn't be here. And now your 15-year-old daughter's going wandering off to see the women of the land. It's a chilling backdrop. We don't have long to wait to see what happens, of course. The rape comes quickly. Verse 2. When Shechem, the son of Hamer, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. The text is clinical. The text is cruel. The details are very simple. It would seem that Shechem, a um, very wealthy, influential, rich daddy, he used, he's very used to sort of getting his own way through his weight around a bit. And there's no hesitation in the text. Just look at verse 2 again. Saw her, seized her, lay with her, humiliated her. Those last two verbs are particularly nasty ones. They're both concerned with sexual brutality. Um, if you're looking at an NIV, um, the NIV actually leaves out the second of those two last verbs, the humiliated verb, and it sort of collapses them both into rape. Um, but actually, this is, this is even worse than rape. As serious as rape is, this crime sort of goes beyond. He, he raped her and then further sexual brutality. It's really nasty. By the end of verse 2, I mean, it's happened so suddenly. By the end of verse 2, it's very easy to miss. We're thinking, poor Dinah. We don't have time um, to deal with all of the, the pain, the shock, the scream, blood, tears. Uh, that may have not been the most wise course of action to go wandering off at that age um, amongst those people at that time. But, but no human being deserves this. That's very clear all the way through. No human being deserves to be treated like this. It should leave us sort of shocked, paralyzed. I mean, how could any human being sink as low as Shechem? It's so obviously wrong. The word spreads very quickly. Um, verse 5, Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter. Verse 7, the sons of Jacob had come in from the field. As soon as they heard of it, the men were indignant, very angry, because he, that is Shechem, had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. The conclusion, verse 7 at the end, probably the sort of the, the main verse of this whole chapter, for such a thing must not be done. If you want a key text, that's it for this chapter. For such a thing must not be done. There can be no doubt this crime is intolerable. You can't have sin like this without some sort of consequence. One of the commentators puts it like this, those who commit moral outrage of the vilest sort against the deepest realities and convictions of the community must be punished to protect the very fabric of the community. It's without doubt. You can argue it from natural law. You can argue it from the way that we're made. It's clear from the text today. The sin is abhorrent. But the focus of the rest of the text seems to be on the reactions to this crime. And I think, I think that's what we're meant to do now. Having, having seen the crime, we're meant to ponder the different reactions. I think this is the way the whole sort of chapter is structured. Look at the very final words of the chapter. Chapter 34, verse 31. But they said, it's the brothers, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? You see, the, the, the whole section seems to be framed by this event, the rape of Dinah. Um, it's a rhetorical question at the end, of course, but it's not there to make us say no. That's absolutely clear. Verse 7, this sort of thing shouldn't be done. 
The rhetorical question is there to make us think about this crime, especially to think about the different reactions. You see, everything else that happens in the text today is a reaction to the crime. We need to ponder these three reactions. We'll spend um, our time doing that. So secondly, the reactions to this sin. Firstly, Shechem, the cover-up. Um, now, just I, mean, I think you, you probably picked this up. Shechem is the name of the city. It's also the name of sort of one of our leading characters as well. He takes the name of the city. Um, and his, that is Shechem's soul, was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman. He spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamar, saying, get me this girl for my wife. Now, as readers, it's very clear. A crime has been committed. Committed. And rather weirdly, no sooner has the crime been committed, the Shechem wants to get married. And it's worth pointing out that the diner at this stage is being held in Shechem's house. It's not like she's in her mother's arms sort of crying. Was Shechem even aware that he'd done something wrong? Well, in one sense, it doesn't really matter. I mean, rape is wrong whether his society accepts it or not. But I think there's plenty of indicators in the text to say that he understands that it's wrong. Uh, you get the really polarized reactions, don't you, between verses 2 and 3. Um, you see the brutal rape in verse 2, and then you see this tender, loving affection in verse 3. Uh, he seems to be well aware of sort of right and wrong, and the fact that he wants marriage by verse 4 is a clear indication that he knows he's acted wrongly in the first place. He's trying to make things right. He's trying to cover things up. A few points to note about this sort of cover-up. I mean, it may well be sincere. There's no reason to doubt that there isn't sincerity in verse 3. His soul was drawn. I wonder what it was that drew his soul to her. Was it, was it the allure of sex? Uh, the natural beauty? We don't get any comment on that. We can't really conclude. Perhaps a gentle character? We don't know. But just because there's a sincere attraction... A sincere desire. It, it doesn't make the situation right. He can't pretend nothing's happened. End of verse 7. We can't get away from it. Such a thing must not be done. Shechem, though, he's determined to get this girl, isn't he? He gets his dad to start negotiating. Come on, dad, get in there. I need to get this girl. Go and speak to the brothers, whatever it takes. Um, the dad tries to get the brothers to see the potential upside of all of this. Verse 8, Hamor, that's the dad, he spoke with the brothers saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it. Get property in it. You see the tactic that's going on here? Pure expediency. Appeal to, uh, trying, to, trying to appeal what is going to be practical and sort of mutually beneficial rather than what's right or wrong. There's, no, there's never any a, a attempt to admit that a crime has been committed on their part. I mean, you can imagine Hamor, the dad, saying, can't you? Come on, chaps. Um, we all know my son. He was a little hasty, a little hasty in all this. That's water under the bridge now. We can all benefit from this going forward. Lots of girls. Lots of girls. All of our daughters in the city. You're a bunch of single men. You'll be wanting wives soon enough. We can come to an arrangement. We can reap the benefits. And don't forget the money. We can all do rather well out of this. That'll go some way to healing any wounds, won't it? But it's like Shechem detects um, that his father's sort of expedient appeal is not working. And so he takes a different approach. Look at verse 11. So the son steps in. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. And whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. Well, I think it's a tactic that the city understands very well. Whatever it takes, I'll give you anything. When everything else fails, what does the city do? I mean, you throw money at it, don't you? It's the standard tactic. Shechem had given it his best shot. And he was one of the most honored in his father's house. Whatever it takes... Well, it hadn't worked. See, it doesn't change the, the simple fact. However sincere this was, and maybe it was sincere, maybe his heart had been changed and he truly, truly felt love for 
her, however expedient, however much money, the fact remains, middle of verse 7, he had done an outrageous thing. End of verse 7, such a thing must not be done. You can't cover it up. And Jacob's reaction, it's, it's no better really, is it? I mean, he may not have committed the sin, but Jacob, he's a poor shadow of a man when it comes to the right reaction. Jacob's an embarrassment through this. Jacob, I've said head in the sand. Was it all his, in the full pla- was it all his um, fault in the first place? I think you can make a pretty good, good case to say, yeah, it probably was his fault to a degree, certainly. I mean, as we've already made clear, he shouldn't be here. He shouldn't have stopped in this God-forsaken place, pitched his tent. Foolish Jacob, but it's, it's too late now. Jacob, you need to pick up the pieces. The unthinkable has just happened. What, what are you going to do about it, Jacob? So we're sort of we're watching Jacob now. I think it's quite astounding, isn't it? I mean, of all the reactions that a father can have upon hearing the news that his daughter has been raped... I went through the papers um, last week to scan for reactions. It's really not hard to find, sadly. Many, many incidents of rape and different people that that comment on it. Um, A father's distress, a mother's fury. Uh, Another incident, the the, the situation has torn the family to pieces. Rape is destructive. Look at Jacob in verse 5. What a contrast. Jacob heard that um, that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, But his sons were with the livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. Held his peace. I mean, it's a pathetic reaction, isn't it? You would run to your daughter. What would you do face to face? I mean, you'd punch him in the face, wouldn't you, at the very least? Something worse, probably. Every human emotion would cry out in rage, distress. Jacob certainly had emotions. I mean, it wasn't long before Joseph was going to be taken away. And boy, he showed emotions then. His daughter has just been raped. Jacob held his peace. And it's as though all through the text, I mean, it's as though he just doesn't really care. I remember this, this is Dinah, the daughter of Leah. We all know what Jacob thought about Leah. Maybe, I mean, could, could it be that he just didn't care about Dinah? Is that possible? But even, I mean, even if Dinah's not his favorite kid, if any father even admits he's got a favorite, I mean, she's your own flesh and blood, Jacob. His pathetic sort of inactivity, it seems, um, you you see it again just after the massacre. Look look down to verse 30. This is just after Simeon and Levi have wiped out the town. Um, And Jacob says to them, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. What was Jacob worried about throughout this whole section and what's really clear by the end here? Well, he only really cares about himself. Look at the text there. You have brought trouble on me. My name will stink. My numbers are few. I shall be destroyed. It's all I, 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 me, me, me. Oh, and he slips in and my household at the end, almost like he's feeling a bit guilty. I mean, Jacob's concerned about number one, anything, to try and knock, not rock the boat. When his daughter is raped, he wants to keep his head down. When the city is annihilated, he thinks only of his own safety. He thinks only of financial and political security. He should be concerned about the honor of his name. I mean, he just built that, that altar. Do you remember the end of chapter 33? Again, we just heard it read. He just built that altar. El Elohi Israel, God, the God of Israel. He's just been named Israel. It's like saying, this is an altar to my God. This is my God. But all he cares about is himself. He seems to have forgotten everything. He sticks his head in the sand. And that leaves, um, thirdly, the reaction of his sons. I think as we read the story, I mean, they, I think they stand in massive contrast to the lack of remorse of Shechem or the inactivity of Jacob to to admit there's a problem. You see, the sons want to do something. The sons really seem to care. They seem to be the sort of the the, the sort of anti-hero of the story. Verse 7, they were indignant, really angry. I think as readers, we're sort of drawn to the sons. Here, Here are people who are going to do something. 
Someone gets the point. This sin is bad. We all admit this, this sort of thing shouldn't happen. And the sons are going to take matters into their own hands. So what are the sons going to do? Well, what do the sons do? Like father, like son. These boys have learned how to deceive. They are well practiced. They've had a good role model. It seems to be in their DNA. No surprises there. Shechem and Hamor, they've, um, they've put forward their, their propositions of this sort of mutually beneficial deal, a sort of new world order of intermarriage and wealth. And yeah, let's not worry about that little incident back there. Let's just sort of go forward and be prosperous together. And so the sons of Jacob hatch a plan. It gives them an angle. Verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. Well, their plan was very straightforward. They were going to lead um, Hamor and Shechem up the garden path. We're going to do a deal. We're really happy to do a deal. We just have one little request. We need you guys to get circumcised, okay? The whole city need you all to get circumcised, every man. A little minor setback, you see, we have this tradition in ours, and you're going to have to get circumcised too. Now, Shechem and Hamor, they like this plan, not least because they think it's going to get them rich again. Verse 23, they say to the other people in the city, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. So they realize, a little bit of circumcision, can't be too bad, then we'll get everything that we need. So they set up a little circumcision checkpoint. Anyone that walks through, any bloke that walks through, gets the snip. Job done. There's perhaps a, a rather sort of twisted, sick irony to this. The organ that had defiled their sister now lay right at the heart of the brother's revenge plan. I think it's fair to assume that after the whole city had been circumcised in a relatively short amount of time, um, that they would have been pretty sore, pretty distracted. The text says as much. Um, perhaps when this was at the absolute lowest point, day three, maybe that was when they were the most tender, the most infected, the most bedridden. At that point, the two older brothers of Dinah, Simeon, Levi, they pick up their swords you can imagine it almost sort of set to soft classical music as they walk in and slash everybody to death. Every male life snuffed out. The text again is clinical, but the backdrop is flowing blood. Verse 25, they killed all the males. Verse 26, in case there's any confusion, that included Hamor and his son Shechem. Okay, you get the point? Everyone's dead. Verse 27, all the brothers came and they joined in and they plundered the city. They took the cash, they took the women, they took the children. And by the end of it, the city, which had shared the name of the guilty individual, had been emptied of life and wealth. Ultimate, complete revenge. The sons snuffed it out. Where does that leave us? I mean, the rape of Dinah is abhorrent, isn't it? The different and varied reactions are in some sense even worse. What makes you sicker? And the thing is, we, we don't have a happy end. I'd love to say, ah, but did you see this verse? But I'm afraid there isn't one. It's just pain and death and misery. So back to the sort of third question that we had. I mean, why? Why are we being shown all this? I think there's a lot that could be said. Um, let me draw out two conclusions from the passage and one from the wider context as we close. Firstly, from the passage, this is all written because we need to know that sin exists. Sin of the most vile and evil kind is part of our world today. I think one of the biggest surprises that comes in this chapter are the different reactions to the rape of Dinah. I think... The big shock is that no one wins in chapter 34. Everyone comes off badly. Everyone ends up miserable. Everyone's covered with blood. Everyone's helpless. And chapter 34 forces us, as I said at the beginning, we have to do, we've got to look at sin straight in the face. Sin is a really serious problem. There's maybe something, just glance at verse 2, 34 verse 2. 
when Shechem first saw Dinah, he saw, he seized, he lay, he humiliated. Perhaps then we're, we're to remember that first ever sin when Eve saw the delicious apple, took and ate. There's a parallel there, perhaps. You see, sin is now built into humanity's DNA. And here in chapter 34, God's so-called people, uh, this is another sort of horrible shock in all of this, God's so-called people are just as bad. God's so-called people here, well, they're worse, aren't they? Worse than the people of the land. It's horrible. In its original setting, I mean, Moses wrote this for the people of Israel as they headed out of Egypt as slaves and into the promised land. They knew hard times in Egypt. They were familiar with slavery in Egypt. And I think the point for them here, know that hard times exist until you get to the promised land. Know it. It's part of this world. And sadly, it's, it's part of the so-called family as well. I mean, the dysfunctional family will blunder its way around from pillar to post. Sin will be amongst you until you get to the promised land. I think we're so used to it, we sort of cauterize our emotions to it, don't we? Um, we see a tragedy on the news, the rape of children in a care home. There are a few of those going on last week, the killing of hostages in Mali. And what do we do when we see these things? We change the channel. We decide the sort of, have I got news for you will be slightly better entertainment before we go to bed. Um, as an example of something that happened to me last week, I'm slightly ashamed to admit it, but I think it makes the point. As I was preparing all of this, it was sort of going around my head, and someone called me. I, as you know, I work um, down on Queen Victoria Street in, in one of the churches there, and um, somebody called me from one of the nearby offices, and he said, something terrible has just happened. Um, someone in my company has just killed themselves, and they've done it really publicly, right in the middle of the office. And I listened as you do when that sort of news comes. And I felt quite detached from it, actually, because you're quite used to hearing things like that. It's not massively unusual. People die every day. And my first reaction, I thought, hmm, that'll make quite a good illustration on Sunday. And then I put down the phone, and I felt horribly convicted. A man has just died. A family has just been robbed of a father a wife of her husband. Because this man is so confused, so sick, that he thought, there's nothing I can do except end my life. I repented. I prayed for those around him. Sin exists. We, we need to be aware of the horrible consequences of sin. The second um, conclusion that comes from, from the passage, you see, the different responses in chapter 34 show just how hopeless humanity is at dealing with sin. The point is not, these aren't characters that we're to be like or not to be like. That's not the point. This is a picture of humanity's absolute inability to do anything to improve the disastrous effects of sin. So you see, first, sin exists. Yeah, look it in the face. We keep doing that. But secondly, we need to see there's nothing we can do about it. Again, Moses, in the original context, wanted the people to understand this. Like them, we need to see there's no human solution for sin. If anything, every human solution, certainly the ones given in our passage today, what happens? It just makes things worse. The downward spiral, as rape leads horribly to massacre. Humanity can't do anything to solve this. I thought and Aaron made a great point as we started our service today, showing us in the confession, as we pray the prayer of confession, notice that it's not saying we should do anything. We're just saying sorry for the sin. Not trying to make amends. And that leads us to the final conclusion, the conclusion that comes from our section. We should rightly be sort of smarting with the, the horror of the sin of chapter 34. But it's not all we know. You see, as readers of Genesis, I mean, we, we've come through this book, haven't we? We've read the first 33 chapters. God may be silent in this chapter. It's interesting. I mean, he doesn't make any comments in this chapter. 
It may not look in our world like God sees. It may not look like God knows. It will often look like God doesn't care. But we know better. We have a God who repeatedly steps into situations of disaster and sin. We have a God. We have a God. Think of the last 33 chapters. We have a God who has a track record for doing the impossible. So as we finish chapter 34, we we rightly wallow in sin. But we can hopefully look back to what God has done, to what God is like. Silent now, yes. But he's done the impossible. The solution to our messed up world is never going to come from us. But it will come from him. All eyes on him, our hope, our faithful, our gracious God, as we wallow and look sin straight in the eyes in chapter 34. Let me close in a short prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we look at the sin in this world. And we're reminded of the horrible, the messed up situation. While we look at the sin in chapter 34, it's sobering. Heavenly Father, may we have the right expectations for life in this world. And may our hope and confidence never be placed on our own ability to do things, but rather on yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we are going to have a question time now, so please do be uh, jotting any questions and raise them. If the stewards can come and start uh, gathering those, it would be uh, great to have them in. And uh, we'll put them to Chris. Chris, do come and stand here. And uh, as we await the sheets, Chris, one question. What should Jacob have done? should have been doing just about anything that should have been doing just about anything that um, anything different to the things he did do I, I think we get a bit of a, a clue don't we from the way that the, the whole section is set up chapter 34 um, if you just look at the 33 that, like we did in, in our time together I think the simple fact that he's settling down and making his home in Shechem when back in chapter 28 he's made this sort of deal with God, this covenant with God that he's on his way to Bethel um, seems to be a bit of a red flag. Um, What should he have done? Well, he should have just kept to the very deal that he had struck and got back to Bethel and not made such a long point of stopping here. There's a lot more that could be said on that, but I think that's the, the indication from the text of where he went wrong at the start. Were the actions of Jacob's sons right? Well, as I said, I mean, they they become the sort of the anti-heroes, don't they? We're desperate for something to happen. Because of verse 7, I do think verse 7 forms the sort of the core bit of the text. Such a thing must not be done. There must be some course of revenge, reprise, something. And so we're sort of with the brothers a little bit, aren't we? But did they do the right thing? Were the actions of the sons right? No, they, they can't have been right. The reformers had, um, had a, a great phrase that they used um, when talking about sin, that sin is a punishment for sin. Um, it's the idea you get in chapter 1 of Romans. Some people will be familiar with it. Just look over to um, Romans at the end of chapter 1. You'll find that on page 1,132. 
and you see through this, this downward spiral of people rejecting God and God giving them over to ever-increasing sin. And you see um, verse 28, I'm just going to draw your attention to. I think there's probably similarities with 34 verse 7. Um, verse 28, and since they did not sit, see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And so the simple fact that things happen in this world that should not be done is testimony to the fact that sin exists. Sin seems to be a punishment for sin. God gives people over to ever-increasing sin. I don't think there's ever a course of action that can say, or, or an argument that could suggest that Jacob's sons had done the right thing. I think it's, it's simply evidence of the increasing spiral and disaster of sin that exists in our world, something that the writer to the Romans makes clear. The sins of chapter 34 are pretty extreme. I don't think I'm really like that at all. Are we really seeing that we are all affected by sin? I think it's easy at one level to reach up to 34 and say, well, I've never committed a rape, I've never committed a massacre, so it's not like me, it doesn't affect me. Um, I, I try to be careful to, to not draw lines like that through this. I think the, the point of chapter 34 is to explain what our world is like. Um, the simple fact that we might not have committed sins as abhorrent as that in the flesh um, doesn't mean that our world isn't infected by them. And we need to have the right expectations of what life is like in this world. And good grief, I mean, the, the, the particular sins listed in chapter 34 are things that are around us all the time. This side of the promised land, God's people will be in the middle of stuff like this. And, and every now and then, it gets horribly close to us as well. There's lots of questions here, lots of hard hitting. I'll try and ask some of the representative, but we won't get them all. Chris, in Genesis there is polygamy. Does God sometimes use sin for good or be turn a blind eye as and when he pleases? Um, polygamy is an interesting one. It does seem to be that during the time of the patriarchs, um, polygamy was allowed, overlooked. Um, it doesn't seem that the, uh, the, the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, that were, were massively condemned for these. That seems to, to carry on through the Bible. It's just not something the Bible comments on particularly. So I think we have to be careful about not extrapolating too much. Um, that said, however, Genesis 2 does make it very clear. One man, one woman. And so the conclusion that we should draw and that is drawn throughout the rest of the Bible is that um, that is the right pattern for humanity going forward. Um, quite what happens, like I said, we're, we're not told that this was wrong for the patriarchs. It seems to be out of step with what the Bible expects. I don't think we can go much further than that. Thinking of Jacob a little bit more generally, um, two questions. Where do you think the biggest turning point is in the story of Jacob? And then related, what are we to make of God's bringing Jacob to dependence on him last week, given he shows no evidence of being a changed man here? Thank you. Well, we're going to say a little bit more about this next week because we're going to try and sort of bring the whole series together, the last 10, um, the last 10 talks or so. I, I, think, I think the very heart of it comes um, where, God's, um, where, where Jacob has, has all the children. Um, you remember 12 children in seven years. I, I think this sort of shows the fulfillment of, of a lot of God's promises. Um, I may have changed my opinion on that by this time next week, so we'll see by next week. But I, th I think that probably is the heart of it. As for what we saw last week, I think it's up and down. I mean, I mean Jacob sort of shows promise, and then he shows complete hopelessness. And I think there's a lot of sort of fluctuation in the life of Jacob. Um, he is basically pretty poor character most of the time. And, um, yeah, not somebody to get massively excited about. I think one of the most incredible things is that you come to the New Testament and you see this phrase that comes up often, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Abraham and Isaac, you think, yeah, yeah, they're great. Abraham, the man of faith. But then you think, Jacob, actually. I mean, his name means deceiver. He's a bit of a rogue all the way through. And yet, it's the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. How amazing. So I, I think it's a tremendous positive that the fact that Jacob is such a rogue and only has occasional moments of ever getting anything right, how encouraging that God is his God, just as he's Abraham's God. 
A question following up on, that, on what Jacob is like. Most weeks in the series, including this, refer to Jacob the deceiver. But the Bible never explicitly criticizes him in this way. Rather, it is Esau despising his birthright that is emphasized in Hebrews. One would be hard-pressed to say that Jacob tricked or deceived Esau in that incident. Isn't Jacob the deceiver a moralizing application that the Bible doesn't make? Well, I know, I seem to remember that you, you had something to say on this. Um, I've spoken enough. Well, it tell, tell us, well, what do you think the answer to that one is? Fair enough, fair enough. Um, yes, if you were here back, I don't know, two months ago, the first in the series, we looked at that incident between when well, Jacob and Esau, and Esau tricked Jacob for the um, birthright, partly. But yes, absolutely right. I remember one of my headings was, don't be like dot, dot, dot. And I made the very same point that the lesson from that certainly wasn't don't be uh, unlike Jacob, but avoid being like Esau. And yes, that's what uh, Hebrews draws from it. And we saw why Esau's sin there was all the more serious because of the way it was related to God. And that is a very important principle. What does the New Testament say about how we should understand these characters? But then you read on in Genesis, and I, I agree with what Chris has just said. It doesn't change the fact that Jacob is a deceiver. That is underlined. And uh, Laban also deceives him, partly showing that uh, Jacob and Laban are cut from the same cloth and they do the same things. And so we can understand narrative and see what the author is trying to tell us. And clearly it's telling us not to imitate Jacob or even, I think better, it is saying we are like Jacob. So Esau stands as the warning don't be like him. And it shows obvious ways that he's turned away from God. Jacob is the deceiver. And there are certain ways that we are drawn in because we want to identify with him and then realize we are like him. That's what it's like. I think the New Testament does actually show us that there was a problem with um, Jacob's deception. John chapter 1, when uh, Jesus speaks of Nathanael and said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I think by implication that is showing us there was a problem with Jacob. He wasn't going to be the solution as we've seen all along. And John is pointing us to the true solution and the fulfillment of God's promises. Chris, back to you. Um, this is our second to last talk. There's one more to come. So a question really on that. We did chapter 34, pretty much um, looked at it in isolation, uh, as maybe we should be. But if the chapter divisions are uninspired, should we continue to the positive note of divine intervention? In the very next verse, 35 verse 1. Yes, come back next week. Brilliant. And uh, with that, I have realised we haven't answered all the questions. Do come and chat to Chris or to me afterwards, and uh, we'll try and help uh, if we can. But for now, uh, let's end mindful of all that we've uh, seen again this week, of what we are like. So sombre thoughts, as we see in our hearts, that we can offer no solution to this problem. And yet, all of this, of course, as we'll see next week, is driving us to what God has done and what he will do about it and the extent to which he went to put this right. So do take up the order of service.